church, sing that. Come on.
we doing this morning? Okay, good. Did that song wake you guys up? Are you ready to praise God here this morning? It is a beautiful day outside, and it's an even more beautiful day here in this place because God is here with us. Let's praise and worship our awesome Father here this morning. Oh, the Lord, our strength and song, highest praise to Him belong. Christ the Lord, our conquering King, your name we raise, your triumph sing. Oh, praise the Lord, our mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand we stand in victory. By his name we've In darkest night, we worship you. You divide the raging seas. From dead to life, you safely lead. Oh, praise the Lord, a mighty warrior. Praise the Lord, the glorious one. By his hand, we stand in victory. By his name.
by His name we've overcome. God is our refuge and our strength. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear.
you guys take a few moments and greet each other? Say hi to everybody that you'd like to say hi to. If you don't know somebody, then go and introduce yourselves and you'll know each other. And give somebody a fist bump for me. Everybody out there on the internet, I see you out there. We're so happy you're with us. Happy Sunday morning to you guys. All right, everybody. Hopefully you have said hello to everyone that you need to speak to. If not, don't worry. There'll be time in between the two services for you all to catch up with each other. But I've got some things for you guys here this morning for the good of the cause. Then we'll get back to singing some more. So let's get down to it. First off, thank you to everybody who came out and participated or cheered on uh, the people who came for the Family Adventure Challenge Day. That was yesterday morning. I think everybody who came had a good time. I know it was a little cold and a little windy and not really very sunny, but it was still a good time. You guys were moving around, so you were able to keep warm. There were a couple wipeouts, yeah, with the, with the Dizzy Bat egg carry. Uh, not actual egg, just to work there. Uh, but yeah, had, had a few wipeouts yesterday. But everybody, I think, survived, and it was a good day uh, if you missed it then make sure you're on the lookout for events like that coming in the future because they will be coming in the future, so get ready, all right? This coming Friday and Saturday, uh, we will be holding a marriage conference right here for those of you who signed up to attend, okay? If you signed up to attend, uh, make sure you are here. Friday night starts at 6.30, and then it will continue on to Saturday morning, so just make sure uh, that you are here Friday at 6.30 if you are one of the ones who signed up to attend that event. And then this coming Saturday morning on April 20th is the Men's Prayer Breakfast at Main Street Cafe and Grill in Parksburg. All the men, you should come and join us. We have a good time. We have good food, good fellowship together, and come out and join us, okay? Not this coming Saturday, but the Saturday after that. On April 27th, we are having a prayer event here. It starts at 9 a.m. Uh, some of us are going to stay in the building and pray over the building. Some of us are going to go out into the community and pray over people in the community. And then after that, at 1030, there's going to be a special event that's happening here as well. Immediately following the prayer walking, there is an event that is sponsored by the newly formed Outreach Prayer Task Force. And the, that group is focused on praying for the growth of Cornerstone and more specifically the salvation and spiritual well-being of those that are outside of our walls. Okay, Everyone is invited to come to this special prayer event sponsored by that team. It starts at 1030 a.m. Uh, and if you are interested in joining that prayer task force, then you should definitely be here. Okay, If you have any questions, talk to Susan right there uh, and Eric or Tony who are over there. Raise your hands, please. Yeah, wave at us. There we go. Okay, talk to them if you have any questions about that. All right. Finally, that Sunday, so April 28th is what I'm talking about now, we are having a potluck luncheon here right after the second service. Okay, the deadline to sign up to let the, the people who know that are in charge of that, that you're attending, is today. Okay, so make sure that you, if you're planning on attending, that you let them know. That way they can plan for you. Okay. Maybe there might be a grace period if you, did, if you don't sign up today, but I don't know. So you don't want to risk it. 
So make sure if you're planning on attending that, that you let them know today by signing up. And just for uh, future, because it's gonna be coming up pretty soon, uh, on May 4th, okay, uh, that's a Saturday. It is Star Wars Day, for those of you nerds out there with me. Uh, but we are also having a movie night here on May 4th, and we're gonna be watching a kid's movie called Lord of the Beans. It's up there? Yeah, it's up there, there we go. To play on Lord of the Rings. That's all the announcements I have for you. What was that? Oh yeah, there's a taco dinner before that, sorry. There's a taco dinner before that, then the movie commences. Okay, so make sure you mark that on your calendar and you join us, it'll be a good night. Shall we stand up and sing some more? All right, let's do it. If you guys weren't awake yet,
Though the earth give way, and though the mountains fall into the sea, though the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, we will not be afraid. No. For God is our refuge and strength. He is, he is an ever-present help in trouble. As we all bow down, as we all come, casting off our crowns, would you hear our cry? We want to see you glorified.
Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for this time that you've given us here to declare that. You are so good, Lord. You are our hope, our help, and our strength. A place to run to in times of trouble. We thank you so much, Lord, that we can put our trust in you. That the battle has already been won by you. And there is no need for us to fear. We love you, Lord. We will praise you with everything that we have and everything that we are. In Jesus' name, amen. You see a mountain moves And as I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I find out Find out There's nothing impossible for you
All right, we are going to move forward in our worship service to the most important thing we do every time we come together, the reading of God's Word. It's going to be found in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 7 to 14. Dr. J is coming forward to read it to us this morning. Remember, these are not just words on a page. This is God speaking to you right now, so listen to what he's telling you. Once Dr. J is done reading the Word of God, kids up to third grade are going to be dismissed to go to cool kids. And our God is good. And all the time, open the floodgates of heaven. Good morning. Music got me all excited. Okay, I'm going to take the risk of preaching a little bit here. Okay, you remember the words of that last song we sang? To whom does the battle belong? Mm hmm. Last night, yesterday, the holy city of God. The city of David, about whom I am going to read to you in just a moment. The city which will be at the center of the world when Jesus Christ returns. Was attacked mercilessly by the enemies of God. Okay? The battle belonged to the Lord. Not one missile out of 300 reached the ground. The scripture tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It reminds us that those who bless God's people in Israel are blessed in turn by God. I call on you today to be sincere in your prayers for the peace of Jerusalem. There's all kinds of stuff going on at Cornerstone. A lot of it you don't know about. Big bucks repairs are required. To whom does the battle belong? Yeah, don't lose faith. God has never failed us yet. The song said that this morning. The battle belongs to the Lord. And there's all kinds of stuff going on in the lives of people who are sitting before me and listening to me right now. To whom does the battle belong? Mm-hmm. And what is our weapon? Praise, praise, praise the Lord. For the battle belongs to the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 30. It's a bad time for David. But the battle belongs to the Lord. The scripture says, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 7. Then David said to Abathar, the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him. And David inquired of Yahweh, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You, certain, you will certainly overtake them and succeed in rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to the Besser Ravine, where some stayed behind. For 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine. But David and 400 men pursued, went, or continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, part of a cake of raisins and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, to whom do you belong? And where do you come from? He said, I am an Egyptian the slave of the Malachite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev of the Carathites and the territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag. Thank you, Dr. J. Kids are on their way to Cool Kids. Miss Ruth is waiting for you at the door. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us in your house today. We thank you for the time of worship we had. 
We ask that you make it pleasing to you. We thank you for the gift of your word, and we ask that you'd open our hearts and our minds, that you'd get me out of the way, and that you would speak to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. How's everybody doing? Okay, you got really quiet there. Uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 30 this morning, so if you would, please join me there. And uh, as you're going, well, while we begin our time together here, let me start by asking you a question, and it is both a silly question and yet a serious question. And the question is this, have you, as a Christian, ever experienced testimony envy? Have you ever experienced testimony envy? Now, let me give you some context in order to understand how to answer that question. Uh, Someone's testimony is the story of what God has done in their life. And occasionally, when a Christian hears another Christian tell the story of their interaction with God, they might envy or be jealous of the story that's told because it isn't the same as theirs. And I, I think this happens in multiple ways. Sometimes there are those Christians who have lived lives and have wandered far away from God and have had rough lives. And sometimes when a person like that hears the story of a Christian who never was very far from God, who, who experienced the fellowship with God through the Holy Spirit for their whole life, that person might be envious of all those years you got to spend close with God where that person was wandering far away. That might happen. I think more commonly it goes the other way. When a person shares their testimony and, and their testimony has all kinds of prodigal tales of how far away they were from God and they were addicted to crack and all, something like that. And then God stepped in and miraculously saved their life from in the midst of their rebellion and they're, and they're going away. A lot of times when Christians hear a story like that, we might be tempted to react out of envy for the magnitude of God saving in that person's life. And you might walk away saying, man, I wish I was addicted to crack. <laughs> now I'm being silly there. But feelings like that can come up, not because we want to be in that situation that that person was in, but because it often seems in our eyes that God acted bigger in that person's life than in ours. Now, I hope that in our less emotional moments, uh, we can understand that we should never envy the testimony of someone else either way. Because each person's walk with God is their own story, specifically designed by God to bring them to Him. And another believer's story is perfectly designed for them, just as yours is for you. But in addition to that, we shouldn't envy other people's testimonies, because all of our stories have common factors. The details of the story may look different, but the theme of the story is the same. Let me explain. Universally, every follower of Jesus, their story contains deciding right and wrong for ourselves, experiencing the consequences of that choice. We often call that hitting rock bottom. And three, turning to God. Every single story of repenting and turning to God and being sanctified has those elements. Now, we might want to assign different degrees to those things, but in reality, those different degrees are false. The person who never went far from God, they might not have robbed a bank or murdered somebody, but their choice to trust their own reasoning instead of God's is just as problematic as the crack addict. Rejecting God is rejecting God, regardless of the details. And being saved by God through His grace is no less impactful, no matter what the details. Bound for hell, disregarding God We all were. None worse, none better. Until God stepped in and saved us. All from the same. Saved us from the same fate 
to the same gift. The turnaround from destruction to sanctification through the grace of God. What makes a good testimony is not the depth of depravity, nor the distance from God. What makes a get good testimony is what we do when we hit rock bottom. Whatever that rock bottom means specifically. Do we turn to God? Then it is a story of victory. And we see the same in the story of David. We are getting near to the end of the book of 1 Samuel, in case you haven't flipped a couple pages ahead and seen that. And as we approach the end of the book, we have to remember that one of the major points of the book of 1 Samuel was to show us the difference between living God's way and living our own way. And the the book illustrated this purpose by showing us the comparison between David, God's choice for king, and Saul, the people's choice for king. And as we get near the end of the book here, we are presented with two final stories as an example of each. God's way and people's way. So here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 30, and we see the last story of David in 1 Samuel. And as we look at the story here, it's it's important to remember what has brought David to this point in his life. David is by no means a perfect man. In fact, David is constantly messing up, just like each of us. It's a good thing. But David is a man after God's own heart, which means David's true desire is to follow God even though he gets it wrong a lot. And what has happened to bring David to this point in his life is that he was serving Saul. But King Saul is a plastic bag blown here and there and never has a solid foundation on anything particularly not in trusting in God. And Saul got jealous and fearful of David taking his throne. So King Saul hunted down David to kill him. We saw this way back before Easter, and we saw that David ran away to the land of the Philistines. And do you remember why David did that? 1 Samuel 27.1 told us that it was because David thought to himself. David did not ask God what to do. David asked David. He decided for himself what the best course of action was. He decided right and wrong for himself. And the Bible tells us that David faced the horrible consequences of his choice to decide right and wrong for himself. He was supposed to accompany the Philistine army into battle against the Israelites. And while those two nations were preoccupied with war against each other, another group seized on the opportunity of everyone being distracted and took that opportunity and raided the unguarded towns of both nations. The Amalekites swept in. The Amalekites are a group of people that are still around because King Saul disobeyed the order of God. The Amalekites are a group of people who who David has aggravated because he's been raiding their towns. And the Amalekites successfully raided all the unguarded cities of the Israelites and the Philistines. And even David's own city, Ziklag, carrying everything off, including the women and the children. Which is a fact that David and his men learned when they were sent away from the war between the Philistines and the Israelites. And we'll get back to that story next week. But what David is confronted with when he gets back to his city is that his city was burned. And in reality, it isn't even his city because the city is in the enemy nation. It wasn't, in, it wasn't in the nation where he's supposed to be. He was supposed to be in God's nation near God's tabernacle. So what he is confronted with is his exile city is burned. His family and the families of his, all his men were taken, maybe never to be seen again. All of their possessions were gone. And his own men were talking about killing him. David had lost everything, literally everything. This was rock bottom. Everything lost. But we read the important verse last week. 
The important verse is verse 6. And verse 6 says that David found strength in Yahweh, his God. David was at rock bottom. But what's important when we hit rock bottom is what we do as a result. And that's the first lesson for us today. What's important is what we do when we hit rock bottom. And that lesson is better phrased for us in a personal way. What will you do when you hit rock bottom? When everything is lost, what will you do? Give up? Are you going to hit rock bottom and start digging? David turned to God. He found strength in God. So will you turn to God and find strength in Him? What's important is what you do when you hit rock bottom. David turned to God and found strength in Him. And then David used the strength he found in God. Verse 7 says, Then David said to Abathar the priest, son of Ahimelech, Bring me the ephod. Abathar brought it to him, and David inquired of Yahweh. So David used the strength that he found in God to ask God what to do. David stopped trusting in David to figure it all out and decide what was right and wrong. And instead, he asked God. He called Abathar the priest. And in this little section of the story, we see a beautiful thing. David is able to inquire of God through the priest of God, by the proper means of determining the will of God at that time, the priestly garments, the ephod, and the use, the use of the Urim and the Thummim. This is an example of God's grace to David. Saul rejected God's, God and his priests so much to the point to kill them, so Abathar, the only one left, is now with David. And even though David, where they are, is because David decided what was best on his own without consulting God, now, experiencing the consequences of his action, God is gracious to David by letting him inquire of the Lord in the proper way. By giving blessings to David that he did not deserve in the presence of God through the presence of his priest. And this is lesson number two for us. God gives us grace even in our rebellion. When we are going our own way, our own way instead of God's way, God is still often so gracious to us, giving us blessings that we don't deserve, ones we don't even see half the time because he loves us. A simple example of this is the same example we see in David, being able to pray to God. How often when you are offended with someone for offending you, will you let them not talk to you? God does not do that with us. He gives us grace in that we can still talk to him even when we've chosen to go our own way and are suffering the consequences because of it. It is a sad thing, the grace of God that we miss seeing because we are blinded by our choice to rebel against the lover of our soul. And David asked God, Shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. So David asked God, Should I go? And God says, Go and you will be successful. Again, undeserved grace. God stooping down to answer us is always grace undeserved. But here, he adds a guarantee of success to it. David found strength in Yahweh his God. And then this strange thing happens in the story. It says in verse 9, David and the 600 men with him came to the Besser Valley, where some stayed behind. 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley, but David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. Now, do you see what's odd about that? Well, you might think it's odd that David chases after a whole army with just 600 men. But that's the odds that David and his men have been dealing with this whole time, so that's nothing new to them. That's not the odd thing. Uh, 
But don't push that aside because being victorious despite overwhelming numerical odds is a constant way that God has been showing his care and protection for David. Maybe you think it's odd that David leaves a third of his force behind because they were too tired to cross the valley. When faced with overwhelming odds, we would probably think it's strange to divide or lessen the number of your soldiers. It is interesting, though, if you read the Bible, how many times God does just that. But that is to show us that what David shouted at the giant Goliath is true. Victory is not in the number of men or in sword or spear. The battle belongs to the Lord, and the victory is already his. David knew that because he found strength in God. And it is most likely, by the way, that the 200 men that were left behind were left behind because the valley contained a river that may have been at flood stage, and they were too exhausted to cross the river in a state like that, and the supplies for the army would have been lost. So they were left behind with the supplies. But the odd part of those verses that are on the screen is the first part of the first verse. David and the 600 men with him. Let me remind you, five minutes ago, they were talking about killing David. Now they're following him. Now they're with him, going against overwhelming numbers. How does that make sense? Well, go back to that most important verse again. David found strength in God. The men had lost everything. They were in despair. And then they looked at David maybe with thoughts of killing him because of what he had caused. But what they saw when they looked at him was not someone defeated and despairing like they were. They saw a man who had lost everything just like them, but who was radiant with the strength of God. And that motivated them to be strong and trust God and David too. So they followed David. So lesson number three is this. When we trust God and when we find strength in him, it can inspire others to do the same. Yeah, you can tell others all you want to trust God. and You can tell them that all you want. But what is more powerful is when they look at you and see you doing it. When we trust God and find strength in him, especially in a difficult situation, our example can be powerful to cause others to make the same choice and trust God as well. Often, our example is more powerful than our words. But a lot of the time, we short-circuit this. A lot of the time, we hide our struggles from each other and we boast about when we get it right. Isn't that what we do? We tell other people how we're great, and we hide how we mess up. That's not the best thing for us to do. The Bible says that we should not do our righteous acts to be seen by others, but we should share our struggles with each other. We tend to do the opposite. The Apostle Paul said that he would boast about his weakness. Why? Because then God's strength can show through. Because when I'm weak in me, I'm strong because I'm relying on him. When David's men looked at him, they didn't see Superman with bullets bouncing off his chest. They saw a man who had lost everything, just like they had, but who was strong with God's strength. We can help others. We can help others when things are going good for us, but our example is more powerful when the weight of the world is on our shoulders and we trust God and find our strength in Him just the same. And when we do that, we inspire others to do the same. 
So inspired by David's trust and the strength he found in God, his men follow him, obeying God's word to pursue the Amalekites. And verse 11 says, They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, a part of a cake of pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, Who are you? Who, who do you belong to? And where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when, we became, when I became ill three days ago. Nice guys, the Amalekites. He says, we raided the Negev of the Carathites, some territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of, of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. So David finds out here that Ziklag is not the only city that the Amalekites have raided. They took the opportunity given by the war between the Philistines and the Israelites to attack everybody. They're all looking the other direction. Let's go, boys. The Carathites are attacked. And later on in the story, the Carathites will become part of David's personal bodyguard led by Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. The towns of Judah and Caleb were attacked. The Philistine towns were attacked. Everybody was attacked. So David asked the man to lead them to the Amalekites. And if you look there, he agrees as long as David agreed not to kill him or turn him over to his master. It would have been really cruel of David to feed the guy and nurse him back to health, only to kill him. But being a slave of the Amalekites, this man was used to cruelty. And he led them to the Amalekites, and David and his men find the Amalekites eating and drinking and having this big party because they have taken so much stuff from unprotected towns in Philistine and Israelite territory. They were partying for the same reason that they had been successful in their raids. Both the Philistines and the Israelites are completely preoccupied with each other. So the Amalekites are having a great time because they have no fear of retaliation because everybody else is somewhere else. Both nations are focused on war, so hey boys, we can just party it up. They didn't even stop at, even far from the raid they'd just done. They didn't stop at any military formation. They're spread out all over the place, drunk and partying, because they thought they were perfectly safe. They were sorely mistaken. The Bible says in verse 17, David fought them from dusk until evening of the next day. None of them got away except for 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. You see, the Amalekites messed around and found out. David's victory over the, their force was complete and total. He brought, the Bible says, he brought everything back. Nothing was missing. And you just have to sit this part of the story and go, wasn't it fortunate that the Philistine commanders had protested to King Achish and have David sent back to Ziklag. If, if they hadn't done that, David would have been involved in the battle against his own people, the nation he's supposed to be king of, in a battle in which, spoiler alert, both his best friend David and King Saul are going to die. And if they hadn't done that, the Amalekites would have gotten away with everything so much that David might not have been able to track them down. And if that all happened and they got the Ziklag and everything's gone, David's men might have killed him. Isn't it fortunate? No, of course not. It was the hand of God at work. God is God. He has all authority. He holds the universe in his hand and nothing escapes his notice. Nothing can thwart his plan or purpose. God can act through the commanders of a nation, which is the enemy of his people, to protect and help David. And all that is true, even when nobody sees it. Even Satan himself does not have the power to overcome the plan of God. God can take what any human or even Satan intends for evil and turn it for good. And that is lesson number four for us. Trust God. He's God. He has all power. Nothing can thwart his plan. He is good, and all he does is good. 
And David and his men returned with all that the Malachites had taken from everywhere. And the text continues in verse 21. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and were left behind at the Bezer Valley. David came out, they, they came out to meet David and the men with him. As David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. They don't get to answer. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man can take his wife and children and go. Remember with me that the men who gathered to David when he fled King Saul were not all the most godly and holy men in the world. Many of them were the opposite. David's band of merry men was not so merry. Uh, they were disgruntled. They were in debt. They were, some of them were fugitives from the law. And the Bible says some of them were evil and troublemakers. I hope this is not a new revelation to you, but even among God's people, there are troublemakers. <laughs> they refused to share what was recovered with the men who had stayed with the supplies, even though I'll remind you that some of what was recovered belonged to those men. Selfishness takes root quickly. Verse 23 says, David replied, No, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given to us. He has protected us and delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down in the battle. All will share alike. The troublemakers focused on themselves and what they could get. David turned the focus back where it should be, to God. He said God had protected them and given them the victory. The troublemaker said, we fought for it, so it's ours. David said, look at what God gave us, so it makes sense to share. The victory was not theirs. The victory belonged to God who had given David the strength to pursue in the first place. So David made it a statute that everyone would share in what was recovered, whether you went into battle or whether you stayed with the supplies. So each man had returned to him what was lost. And the text goes on to tell us that in addition to that, David sent some of what was recovered to many places all over. The implication of this being is that David is seeking to return what was taken from the places that the Amalekites raided. He's attempting to mend relationships. David saw that the battle was a gift from God. The victory was a gift from God, so he gave back what he received out of his gratitude to God for what God had done. And to bring the story of David in the book of 1 Samuel to a close, because this is where he leaves the story. Trust God. He has all power and all authority. Nothing escapes his notice. And nothing can thwart his plan. God can use what was intended for evil to bring good. Nothing can overcome the plan and purpose of God. As the apostle said, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even in the worst times, God is still gracious and loving to us. Even when we don't see it, there is no reason not to trust him. He is good, and all he does is good. When we trust God, and when we find strength in him and follow him, especially in difficult times, when we do that first, we put ourselves in the best possible path because he's good, and what he does is good, including how to tell us to live our lives. So when we follow how to tell, he tells us to live our lives, we put ourselves in the best path. But also, when we do that, our example can inspire others to trust him and find strength in him too. 
So, don't hide your struggles and brag about your righteousness. Do the opposite. That's why we gain strength from the stories and the examples in the Bible. Those are the great stories, the ones that really matter, the ones that are full of darkness, and sometimes you don't want to know the end because it looks so dark. How could the story end happy? How could the world go back to everything before everything was messed up? But in the end, when we trust God, it is just a passing shadow. Darkness passes. A new day comes. The sun shines brighter because of finding, faith in, finding strength in God. Those are the stories that stay with us. The ones that really mean something. The ones that really inspire us to trust God and follow Him. It's not a person who never struggles. It's the person who finds strength in God. Because God's strength keeps them going even in the midst of difficulty. Those are the stories that matter. So if you want your story to matter... Boast about your weakness. Because when you are weak, then he is strong. Look what we've seen in the life of David. Just in this story. David sought God's advice. He trusted and believed God and did what God told him to do. And God gave him great victory. And then David shared the reward of his success with others. That's quite a turnaround from running away into the enemy territory because he thought for himself that was what was best to do. So I ask you, what caused that great turnaround? What was the turning point in the story of David that we've just seen? What took David from going his own way, trusting himself, deciding for himself what was right and wrong, and turned him to trusting and following God and being given that great victory. What was the difference? Well, at rock bottom, David found strength in God. What's important is what we do when we hit rock bottom. Now, maybe you're here today and you feel like you're as low as you can be, that you're at rock bottom. You know what you should do? Turn to God and find strength in Him. Follow Him and trust Him. And maybe you're here today and you're not at rock bottom. Well, hang on because life is a series of ups and downs. And if you're not at rock bottom today, I don't know. But even if that's the case, don't boast about how great things are, boast about your weakness. Boast about the strength of God and help each other find strength in Him. Regardless of what your testimony looks like, the details of what the story contains for your walk with God, the important part is what we do when we hit rock bottom. What makes a great story, a powerful story, one worth telling, a life worth living, is the strength of God. So find strength in God. Let's stand up and sing one last song as we conclude our worship here this morning. Exalted far 
with us as you go from this place. May the grace of God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you all. We love you guys. ABFs are starting right now. <laughs> 